Thanks. So um, when John invited me to come, he asked me to talk about outcomes and assessment. And I, I have some of that in this talk. And I have, having listened to the talks this morning, I think one of the challenges that you will see in this talk is, and in the approach that's different than what we heard about management in the forest this morning, is that we've been thinking about how to tackle this at scale. And one of the problems that we are struggling with, and this will come out, is when you set outputs or outcomes for at-scale conservation, you run into data limitations. If you are projecting change across a multi-state region and you want to measure that change for an individual bird species or mammal, where does the data come from? And that's in part the message that I want to try to get across. Let's see. So just a little bit of background. NIFWF is actually kind of a quasi-public organization. We were chartered by Congress in 1984. Uh, we have a 30-member board. It includes the Director of Fish and Wildlife Service and the NOAA Administrator. So we have public funding. We have a direct line of appropriations from DOI and from Commerce. NIFWF is facilitating collaboration with that funding. We put public funding and private funding together and we turn it all over and put it back on the ground for conservation. It says we, this chart here says we are an implementer. That's, we don't do the projects, we facilitate implementation. And the contrast is we don't do advocacy and we can't because we take public money. So in the mid 2000s, our board stepped back and said, so what has been the impact of all of this money that NIFWF has put out on the ground. And our science team and staff stepped back and realized they really could not come back with a cohesive message of how all of this funding had contributed to conservation change. Yeah, there's random acts of excellent conservation kindness that had been scattered across the entire country. And then the challenge came from the board, so we don't know what we've done, but we want to. So we challenge you to develop longer term and science-based conservation programs that can demonstrate measurable outcome. That term, move the needle for conservation. And so that was what was put on the table. And this was about 2006. And so the science team stepped back and said, well, what do we know? Well, we know kind of what's happening to some species. We understand that there's some problems in particular places with um, issues that are driving change in key ecological places and the board has told us we need to really figure out how to move the needle so maybe the focus is on species and figuring out metrics for measuring success and if we bind, bound this, make this time bound perhaps we can come up with some way of assessing output all while being cost effective and thinking about this term of ROI, return on investment. So what this gave rise to was this era in NIFWF history called the Keystone Initiatives. And there were about 30 some odd of, 30 some odd Keystone Initiatives. They started in 2008, and there was a freshwater aquatic, a marine program, terrestrial wildlife, and a bird program. And all of this planning for keystones, we needed to figure out how to convey what we were going to do. And it was grounded in the open standards for conservation, this five-step process of conceptualizing an idea, planning, implementing, assessing outputs, and then using the lesson, capturing the lessons learned and then feeding it back in. And the tool that we developed or that we ratified for conservation was this notion of a business plan. And essentially it became our roadmap of how to do conservation for a particular species or habitat. The funding required the strategies, the partners that were a part of this, and these were all developed with stakeholder, external stakeholder groups and partners, and the desired outcomes that we were hoping to achieve. A key aspect that we capture within this is getting the data out. How do we know what we're learning through our investments. And we came up with a couple of tools and methods for our self-evaluation. We have these things called annual scorecards that roll out information for species and habitats within individual programs. And then periodically, 
we were doing internal assessments to really step back and look at the whole program. Were we tracking the way we thought we would over the 10-year period of these plans? And if we didn't have the internal bandwidth to do that, we would contract external or third-party assessments to inform our learning. So distilling all of that background on NIFWF to forestry, one of the keystones that arose in this period was an effort focused on early successional habitat. Dozens of, the dozens of species of dependent wildlife had been in decline for a long period of time. It was recognized that habitat loss was a primary driver in all of this. And so we identified a strategy for American woodcock and golden wing warbler focused on restoring and creating early successional habitat. Later in the initiative's tenure, we folded in New England cottontail because there was a lot of co-occupancy of needed work and overlap in habitat usage. And within this keystone, the director at the time set very ambitious continental bird goals. And the idea was that we would use existing monitoring, the Singing Ground Survey and BBS, to assess our change. Well, what did we learn? Well, the first thing we learned was that we could create habitat. And over the first seven or eight years of the program, more than 850,000 new acres of early successional habitat was created across a 19-state region. And we also learned very clearly that, that if you build it, they will come. And that site monitoring validated species response at the local scale. And the chart in the upper right is uh, showing a response of golden wing warbler across public and private lands to creation of new habitat. But the big challenge that we identified was that we didn't have data to assess these continental changes that were projected in the business plan. The Singing Ground Survey and the BBS routes are not, not every route is run every year. And the data don't always overlap where habitat is being implemented. And so when we started to try to build this out and look at the influence of habitat creation on our bird goals, we found we really couldn't measure the change. And it, it precipitated some kind of some self-reflection. And about the same time this was happening, a lot of newer data was emerging that suggested that birds don't use one habitat within a forest and that we had taken a habitat type out of a forest. Early successional is only one serial stage within a forest continuum. And that that combined with the information that suggests that during one period in a bird's life history, they may use one habitat and then another, they're actually using something entirely different. Wood thrush are moving their young into early successional habitat. Golden wings are moving into mature forest. It's more of a continuum so the com combined experience of not understanding how to measure this and realizing we need to think through how to proceed resulted in thinking more holistically about forest conservation for wildlife, with, and in our case, with birds as an indicator. And so we've really moved wholesale from these single species focused initiatives to this notion of landscapes. And within our region, Within the eastern forest region, we have three planning blocks that overlap with forest bird conservation priorities. Our New England Rivers and Forests Program, our Delaware River Watershed Program, and our Central App Appalachian Program, which is a new planning unit. We have a Chesapeake Program that includes an upstream or um, uh, cold headwater component, but it doesn't have a forest piece. It's really focused on brook trout in the upper reaches of the watershed. So our first step into this new arena of considering how to manage forests for wildlife and at scale was in the Delaware River watershed. And it's a, you know, it's a large watershed. It's a significant drinking water source for many people. And that's comp an important component because water quality is a driver in our funding in this. But it's also important for birds and wildlife. And the, the step that we started to take with this program was looking at how do you manage contiguous blocks of forest to get the best bang for the buck for a diversity of wildlife. And so we articulated goals 
conveniently for indicator species. Golden wing for young forest habitat, wood thrush for more mature structured forest, and cerulean for late stage or old growth forest with an open canopy gap. And what we were trying to achieve in this planning effort was thinking about breaking up this largely even-aged forest that exists across much of our region. You know, a lot of it is 60 to 100 years old. There are gaps that are created either by development or the rare wind or ice event. But a lot of it is still one monotypic stand. And in sizing age change and diversity structure within a forest, we thought and we were hearing would provide a broader benefit for bird conservation in the region. So we started to try to figure out with partners, how would we plan, and the other piece is, this, is the time step, is how do you plan both at scale and over a long period of time to ensure within any block of forest that there is available habitat for these three species. So we're undertaking an effort to plan out about 100 years of block forest management within two or three blocks in the upper Delaware River watershed. The metrics that we will use to evaluate success are grounded in the science of the birds. We know what they need from an average territory size, and if we just do a simple multiplication of habitat we're creating versus territory size, you get some measure of how many territories we would expect to occur in a particular space <coughs> on land. This is not going to be without challenge to undertake this effort. And as I alluded to at the beginning, data monitoring will be instrumental in helping us understand whether we can do this. We know we can monitor at these scales of 5,000 acres. That should not be that much of a challenge. It's a, it's a combination of point count, point count data and modeled occupancy. It's when we start thinking about rolling together forest blocks that are relatively contiguous with each other and taking it to the 10 to 20 to 30,000 acre scale that we start to run into new challenges. Where we're growing out this concept of forest bird management at a block scale is in the Central Apps region. And this is a non-completed business plan. We are working through our goals. This is information has uh, not been vetted yet, but essentially we're looking at trying to manage between 30 and 150,000 acres of habitat uh, for birds within the region. The bird goals here that are on the screen are set for 30,000 acre scale. The maps on the left or on your right show the planning unit. The map at the top where it's red, the, using occupancy models, that's where the three species are overlapping. The bottom map is showing at the Huck 8 watershed level. If we broke this apart and thought about it as a watershed driven management program, and, and there's reasons for that because we're also working on aquatic species, where would we get the biggest bang for the buck if we were to concentrate putting forest blocks on the ground in particular areas? And the areas that are lighting up red are the ones that have the best opportunity uh, highest degree of overlap and the highest degree of intact habitat. So that's the effort that we're undertaking now. We are scaling up, trying to figure out how to measure success. And one of the fundamental questions we're still trying to answer is whether this whole shift in managing forests for age and structural diversity will really result in change on the ground for bird distribution and density. We think it will. Um, but we need to ground this in data um, and monitoring frameworks to assess this kind of landscape scale response. And as I said a moment ago, we're confident that we can do this at the site level and at the block scale. But the challenge becomes when we start thinking about bigger acreages. And I grabbed this off eBird just the other night, and I think that there's really Strong reasons to think about the eBird project as a potential new tool that can help us address questions of occupancy and species trend information at scale. There is a lot of power in the data coming into eBird and coupling point count sampling with eBird protocols to make sure that the data get in, gets in and so that the degree of information is even increasing more 
I think we're going to start to get outputs that help us answer questions around does forest management lead to change and are these tools appropriate to do so. You're going to hear a little bit more about eBird later this afternoon. Uh, one of the scientists from Cornell is going to be on the phone. Um, and he's going to talk about the eBird project. And so cost-effective monitoring program, other questions we're trying to address through our work are what are the common measures of success that help us evaluate our impact across multiple landscapes? Um, as I said, there are three programs that overlap the eastern forests. We're coming together on our focal species and our approaches. How do we better communicate to our board that these efforts together are resulting in this kind of change. So we're trying to put context to our work. And then whether there is any ability to roll this up to better understand the national impacts on bird conservation. That's all I got. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. That was great. Um, and we've got time for maybe two questions. Do you, do you anticipate um, initiating a citizen science effort to collect the monitoring data via eBird, or? I don't think so. I think what we would try to figure out with our partners is whether we require the data to go into eBird, and that's a step we have not done yet, but it's certainly something we can do in contracting so that those data streams are available. We wouldn't support, yes, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to go out and collect the field data. Yeah, and I don't know how to incentivize it. I think birders self-incentivize in a lot of ways. The checklists that are now available on our iOS or, or otherwise devices have, you know, your monthly totals available and built-in competition measures that for some people is a, a way of challenging them to collect more. It doesn't work for everybody. I have it. It doesn't drive me to go out and collect another list, but... I, I don't know. That's probably not a challenge we would fully address. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Scott.